Okay, so when we examine the abdomen, um, or when we're doing an, an abdominal exam, we start with basic things. So firstly, we ask the patient to empty their bladder because we don't want to be examining them with the full bladder because that might be a little bit uncomfortable for the patient. And then um, we examine them lying supine, usually as flat as possible, but it's not usually um, ideal for some patients, especially those with like respiratory problems. So patients with COPD, for example, or like even heart failure. So you might have to raise the bed a little bit. So you raise the the, the head end of the bed just slightly, maybe up to 30 degrees, if that makes them feel more comfortable. We also need to elevate the knees a little bit. So put like pillows under the knees just to make the patients feel more comfortable, especially if they have pain. Um, and that would just reduce the tension in the abdomen as well if their knees are slightly lifted up with a pillow. We need to think about draping the patients. So as we lie them flat, um, we need to obviously expose the abdomen. So the abdomen, it um, we need to remember the landmarks that we learned from the lectures. So we have the cyphoid process, we have the costal margins here, and then anything below up to the level of this pubic symphysis and the anterior iliac, anterior superior iliac spine, that's the area of the abdomen. So that's the area that we're examining. So anything that's not that area, you have to drape. So you have to drape obviously below the level of the pubic symphysis. And if they're wearing a shirt, you have to like lift it up just below the cyphoid process. So you have to ask the patient for any areas of pain um, and you have to examine those areas last. You don't go straight into where <laughs> the painful area is. Another good point is you have to warm your hands before you touch the patient. Just, you know, <laughs> the worst thing is being touched with cold hands. So you, you, you do this by washing your hands um, in uh, warm running water or just rubbing them together because that friction generates heat. Also with the stethoscope, um, it might be a good idea to like warm the, the bell or the diaphragm, whichever ones you're gonna, you, whichever part you're gonna be using. Just so when you place this on the patient's skin, it's not cold. It's just, you know, just for their comfort and it's just much nicer if they don't get <laughs> you know <laughs> cold hands or cold stethoscope um, onto their skin the next bit is the actual physical exam so how you so you know how in other bodily systems we do inspection um, palpation percussion and then auscultation in the abdomen it's not <laughs> it's not that way around so we start we still start with inspection and then we do auscultation and then we do percussion and then we do palpation. And the reason for this is because once you start touching the patient, so when you do percussion and palpation, that might alter bowel sounds. So you have to auscultate first before you start percussing and before you start palpating the abdomen. So inspection. So when the patient is lying supine on the um, examination bed, you just look at the patient, um, general appearance, you know, any signs of discomfort, any signs of pain. Usually their facial expressions would give it away. Um, you need to look at their color. Are they pale? Um, you know, yellowish skin would indicate jaundice. So things like that. And then you move on to actually inspecting the abdomen. So um, we look for, um, again, the general appearance of the skin. So color of the skin, any ecchymosis, any bruises, any um, scars from previous surgeries. You can also look at the contour of the abdomen. So we need to determine if it's like normal, if it's bulging or distended, or if it's scaphoid. So scaphoid is the opposite of distended. <laughs> it's usually seen when patients are a little bit underweight. Um, or anorexic um, so the bulging of the flanks may indicate ascites and uh, suprapubic bulge so bulging in the suprapubic area may indicate uh, may suggest bladder distensions asymmetry in the abdomen or any protrusion might indicate some hernias so a protrusion in the umbilicus may indicate hiatus hiatal hernia and um, uh, obviously protrusion in the inguinal and the femoral region could indicate inguinal and femoral hernias. We also need to look at pulsation. So if there's visible pulsation um, in, in the midline, in the abdomen, then, you know, that might suggest some 
like an aortic aneurysm or something, which is, by the way, a, um, a surgical emergency. So, you know, that we need to pay attention to. And then we move on to auscultation. So again, this must be done before uh, palpation and percussion because all those, any, any maneuvers that you do with the abdomen may alter bowel sounds. So what do we listen for? So firstly, we listen, sorry, I'm getting my stethoscope. So firstly, we listen to bowel sounds. So um, you listen for bowel sounds in all four quadrants. So the upper, the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, and the left lower quadrant. Um, you just put your uh, stethoscope, so we use a diaphragm of the stethoscope. <laughs> you just um, put them in those areas and you listen for bowel sounds. So what you hear exactly are like gurgling or like um, just gurgling noises. So um, there's, there's, a, there's a scientific name for it, which I can't remember right now. Um, boring me or something i can't remember but rumbling or gurgling noises there's a there's a medical name for it i forgotten right now but you listen for those in all four quadrants and before you conclude that bowel sounds are absent you need to be patient so you need to listen to it uh for about i've, I've read in some books that you need to listen for two minutes in some books it says five minutes so i'm just gonna say two to five minutes if you don't hear anything then you can conclude that bowel sounds are absent, but do not say bowel sounds are absent without waiting for at least two to five minutes, okay? And the next thing that we listen to um, would be like the vasculature. So um, we have great vessels in the abdomen. So we have the aorta, then we have the bilateral renal arteries, then the bilateral um, uh, iliac arteries and the bilateral femoral arteries further down. So you need to listen for bruits and bruits indicate, you know, turbulent blood flow in those arteries. Bruits can indicate like stenosis or um, vascular occlusive diseases in the arteries. So those are really, really important findings. So the next part of the examination is percussion. So in general, the four quadrants are tympanitic um, and any if it turns into dull so dullness may indicate obviously an organ beneath the surface or organomegaly um, you know the enlargement of the organs distension distension of the organs underneath or any uh, mass that's forming inside or if the patient is just constipated <laughs> so we percuss firstly for the liver so we do this to um, find where the liver is and estimate the size of the liver um, you know, to make sure that um, we don't have any hepatomegaly, which is the enlargement of the liver. So the liver, as you remember, is on the right upper quadrant, and it's usually between 6 to 12 centimeters um, in length. Is that length? That? I don't even know. Is that length or width? I'm really bad. So yeah, it has to be 6 to 12. So what you do to find the superior border of the liver is you start at the level of T4, which is usually the nipple line at the level of the nipple, um, and then midclavicular. So, you know, between, you know, in the middle of the clavicle. So T4, midclavicular, your pleximeter finger and your plexor finger, you just tap, 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 tap. I'm not doing it properly. You just like tap and you, as you go down, yeah? And, this is to find the superior border of the liver. And what you would notice is it would change from resonant to dullness. Resonant because you're kind of like percussing the lung area. And the lungs are resonant in nature when you percuss them. And it's going to change, 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 change. It's going to be, it's going to be um, resonant, 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 then dullness. And then you mark that area with a pen or something. And that indicates the superior border of the liver. And then... To find the inferior border of the liver, you, um, don't know if you can see, this is my umbilicus. <laughs> you start at the level of the umbilicus um, and then make clavicular, so it's here. And then put your plexometer finger, your plexor finger, up, 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 percuss, up, up, up. And it's going to change from tympanitic, tympany, to dullness. Again, because the abdomen is generally tympanitic and if there's um, an organ underneath, then it's going to sound dull. Yeah, 
So it's going to change from tympani to dullness, and that's the inferior border of your liver. And the distance between the superior and inferior border of the borders of the liver should be between 6 to 12 centimeter. The next organ that we percuss is the spleen. So the spleen is on the other side. So you go to the patient's <coughs> left side, of course. So usually the spleen is tucked underneath a rib cage, but when, the, when we have splenomegaly, um, the spleen kind of migrates inferiorly and laterally. So what you do to percuss is you start midclavicular and then obviously midclavicular and find the um, anterior costal margin here, and then you percuss to the mid axillary line. And um, if there is splenomegaly, there would be a shift in dullness. So it would usually replace the tympanitic um, sound of the stomach to dullness, okay? So that's what you're gonna hear if there is um, splenomeg spleen. I don't know if it's spleno or splenomegaly, but you get what I mean. <laughs> the last um, organ organs that we percuss are the kidneys. But the problem with this is, you know, that our patient is lying supine on the examination bed. We need to make them sit up and we need to either move to the back of the patient or make the patient face, you know, their back towards us. So I'm here and my, this is my patient's back. And what I do is I put one hand on the CVA, so the costovertebral angle. And with another hand, I lightly strike this, yeah, and this is on the CVA of the patient. And if they feel pain, then um, this might suggest pilot pyonephritis. So we've done inspection, we've done um, auscultation, we've done percussion, and now it's time to do the last bit, which is palpation. So with palpation, you first need to start palpating lightly. And what that means is you start with one hand and you palpate lightly all four quadrants, see if there's any um, signs of, uh, see if there's any pain, any tenderness, um, any um, guarding or rigidity. So rigidity is like the involuntary contraction of the abdominal muscles, whereas guarding is the voluntary contraction of the muscles. So if there's rigidity, um, this might indicate, you know, an inflammation in the peritoneum. Um, so we need to, you need to be aware of, of that. You would feel it. Um, so you start with light palpation and then you move into deep palpation. So with deep palpation, we use two hands and we obviously go deeper than it's really hard to demonstrate without a person <laughs> so you just go deeper like a lot deeper than light palpation okay and you palpate specific uh, you again do the off you again do this with all four quadrants and then you start um, palpating individual organs specifically so we first start with the liver so the liver um, we normally do this hooking technique. So you hook it in like the costal margin and you ask the patient to deep, to take deep breaths. And you should, what you should feel is you should feel the, the border of the liver brush against your fingers. Um, and it should feel quite smooth, um, not nodular. Then you move on um, to palpating the spleen. So the spleen is on the other side. Um, it's usually not palpable under normal circumstances unless it's enlarged. Um, so don't you know, don't force yourself to try and feel the spleen if you can't feel it. The next thing that we palpate is the aorta. So the aorta is kind of like midline. What you do is, for example, this is the aorta. <laughs> okay, we're putting it here. I don't know if you can see. So what I'll do is to put my um, hands down and kind of like feel the pulsations and then slowly inch out until I can't feel the, pulsa the pulsations anymore. And I note that distance and that should be under three centimeters. If it's small, then it might point towards um, aortic aneurysm. Also, if we, could, if we could hear the bruits, then that just adds evidence to the possibility of an aortic aneurysm. And then the last thing that we palpate would be the uh, the bladder. Um, again, the bladder is usually non-palpable unless 
it's distended. But we still need to palpate the bladder, see if there's any super pubic tenderness there. Um, you know, that might give us a clue into the underlying pathology.